Hello everyone, welcome to Engineered Learnings. Engineered Learnings has been created as an effort to help and reach out to all the engineering students, aspirants and professionals out there with the basic understanding and the crux of the topics important for placements, vivas, semesters, competitive examinations and all types of interviews. So let's go to today's topic. Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. So today we are going to discuss about CRU, Catalytic Reforming Unit, a very important section of the refinery industry because we have been re uh, requested by many of our subscribers to make more videos on refineries. So we are up with the topic of CRU, uh, Catalytic Reforming Unit. Now before understanding Catalytic Reforming, let me give you a small example. A person is driving a car on a highway on a sunny day, 2-4 to four hours constantly. So what happened is, his engine has got heated up. So what has happened is, that when he is driving the car, if supposedly this is my engine, if this is my piston cylinder arrangement, so what happens is, at regular intervals, this piston will come down to this level, the spark will be ignited, and the piston will go up. This is a cyclic arrangement. It happens such that at regular intervals, the piston will come down, the spark will be ignited, the piston will go up, and the wheel will rotate by uh, uh, mechanism. So this is the exact structure in simplified uh, terms of an IC petrol engine because it's a spark ignition engine. Whenever the spark ignites, the petrol, the gasoline vapors should expand by burning, and the, and the, the piston should go up. Now what happens is, since he has been driving the car for 4 to 5 hours, his engine has got heated up and this gas in the chamber has heated up to an extent to under auto ignition, under auto ignition at this level. That is, when the piston is compressing the gas before it could reach the level when the spark would be ignited, before even the spark is ignited, it has heated up to an extent that it undergoes auto ignition. That is, it burns by itself without a spark and the piston goes up before the desirable time, that is at this level supposedly. This is the desirable level, this is the level that is it is undergoing a premature ignition due to the auto ignition of the gas in the chamber. So when we are driving an engine with, a pet, with petrol, the desirable property of the gasoline or the petrol that we are using should be such that the temperature may be so high, it should never cross the auto ignition temperature of the gasoline vapors. To ensure that no auto ignition takes place, we have to maintain a high octane number in the chamber. Now, why the high octane number? What does the high octane number signify? Now, you will have to know that why the auto ignition is taking place. If we go to the structure of hydrocarbons, if this is my hydrocarbon, if this is my gasoline structure that is taking place, that is my C6, if this is my NC6, that is normal C6 chain. So what happens is, first of all, it is allowing an easy attack of oxygen here. Because of which in the, in the carbon center, it is an easy attack of oxygen. Multiple carbon centers it is getting, so it is the easy attack of oxygen and auto ignition is taking place. Moreover, more is the hydrogen quantity. That is the more is the paraffinic nature of the hydrocarbon. That is more is the H percentage. Easier is the burning because H is a great supporter of combustion. So, in the process to decrease the auto ignition tendency and to increase the auto ignition temperature, that is, it should not undergo auto ignition at a low temperature. It should undergo auto ignition at a very high temperature. That is, no easy or premature auto ignition of the gas should take place, we should ensure that this oxygen supply is blocked. How will we ensure that? By creating some static hindrance, some static hindrance across this carbon. That is by creating chains. That is, it shouldn't be a straight chain, it should be a branched carbon center, which will prevent the oxygen, the easy attack of oxygen to the carbon center. So this is the first thing that we should do, that we should create a clustered structure Second thing that we should do is we should decrease the hydrogen content. The entire catalytic reforming unit is based on this principle. It is basically reforming the carbon structure such that the easy attack of oxygen is prevented and the hydrogen content in the uh, chain or in the carbon that we are burning is basically decreased. 
But the octal number shouldn't be high beyond the point to be kept in mind because then if it is too high, the octal number is too high, that is you've removed all the hydrogen, you've created a lot of steady interference, then even when the spark is ignited, it may not burn. We have to make sure that it is within a certain range such that no auto ignition takes place, but spark ignition takes place. SI should take takes place, should take place, but no AI, that is no auto ignition should take place. So to ensure this property of gasoline, the structure is being changed, that is reformed. And this is the work of the catalytic reforming unit. Now, if we talk about the different principles that a catalytic reforming unit forms, the first principle is isomerization. As I've already said, that if it is a straight chain carbon, supposedly four carbons. Now, if we create a structure like this, supposedly my five, six carbons were there, I have created a structure like this. This is a possible structure. That is one of the carbon, same with the same hydrogen and the carbon number definitely, we are creating an isomerization structure. That is one of them is coming in the branched chain. So what is happening is the carbon that was easily susceptible to attack of oxygen has now decreased this chain, this branch chain has now decreased the susceptibility of the attack of this carbon, has decreased the susceptibility of attack of this this and this carbon because it's creating a steric hindrance cloud across the carbon which is preventing the easy attack of oxygen. So it is basically stopping the oxygen from directly attacking the carbon which would have been a straight away possibility in a straight chain. So this is the isomerization concept. You have to isomerize the straight chain structures into branched chain structures. Now coming to aromatization, my next concept. What is aromatization? That is if you see it is nothing but this. Supposedly, if I talk about NC6, that is straight chain C6, that is straight chain hexane, to benzene, that is also C6, but it is having a structure something like this. So what happens is, first of all, it is having a pi cloud all over its place which is creating a negative ambience and is creating a cloud cluster so it is not attacking it is not allowing the easy attack on the carbon centers because the pi uh, cloud is creating a steady hindrance firstly secondly the hydrogen number has also decreased nc6 the hydrogen number is quite evidently more whenever we include double bonds or the kq structure the hydrogen number also decreases that is only one hydrogen with each carbon is associated Whereas two, two hydrogens in each carbon was associated in the NC6 chain. So the hydrogen number has decreased, the steric hindrance has increased. This is the concept of aromatization. Now talking about the third concept, dehydrogenation. Very important concept as I have already mentioned to decrease the hydrogen number. That is, supposedly this is a cyclic structure. CH2, CH2, this is a cyclic structure. That is C6H2, cyclohexane cyclohexane. Now what happens is, if we make it benzene, we have straight away done nothing but decrease the carbon number. We have uh, decreased the hydrogen number. Sorry, we have decreased the hydrogen number. So straight away, hydrogen is a supporter of combustion and we have prevented the pre-ignition or the auto-ignition, easy auto-ignition of this cyclohexane structure by converting it to benzene. So straight away dehydrogenation prevents autoignition or the easy combustion. This is the third concept. Now we're coming to the fourth concept, dehydrocyclization. What is dehydrocyclization? It is nothing but once again, supposedly NC6, we are converting that to Dehydrocyclization means nothing but then again this. First, we are converting it to a, a cyclic structure, cyclization, and we are removing the hydrogen. So NC6 to benzene once again, the aromatization concept. Same dehydro hydrogen removal and cyclization creating a steric entrance, preventing the easy attack of oxygen. Now coming to the fourth reaction that can take place in a catalytic reforming unit is dehydroisomerization. So what happens is, if this is my supposedly my structure, six carbon atoms, 
it is methyl pentane nothing but methyl cyclopentane two again six carbon atoms benzene as the name suggests dehydro first of all the hydrogen are being removed secondly it is an isomeric structure it is an isomerization that is taking place so basically this one this is an isomer to this and this is an isomer to this so they are isomers to each other so isomerization is taking place plus dehydrogenation is taking place so dehydroisomerization and then again steric hindrance and uh, hydrogen supply decrease so easy attack of oxygen and easy combustion is prevented and finally the catalytic reforming unit having a reaction of hydrocracking now this is important this is interesting that suppose it be a straight chain nc8 is present so what it does is it creates a structure like this nc8 broken to c c c c c c plus C2 that is ethane. So what happens is it breaks the straight C8 carbon, cracks it into two parts. One is ethane that is a gaseous structure, another is a liquid structure which is an isomeric structure of N1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, NC6, isomeric structure, isomeric structure of NC6. So what happens is it converts the straight chain carbon which was susceptible to attack by oxygen into a branched chain carbon plus it has created some amount of gas now this is the only reaction where hydrogen is being added now you can question that we are adding hydrogen but we are creating branching we are not at all allowing the easy attack in a straight chain so actually we are compromising on some aspect to enhance the other aspect we are preferring isomerization over hydro uh, dehydrogenation in this case Another reason for introducing hydrogen in the chamber, a very, very important question that why, when we want to remove hydrogen, we don't want easy attack. Whenever we feed the petrol, we don't want easy attack of oxygen. We don't want a supporter of combustion in the petroleum chamber. Then why are we at all introducing hydrogen? So what happens is, in all this reaction, dehydrogenation is taking place. So whenever dehydrogenation is taking place, the the paraphilic nature of the compounds is decreasing that is it is tending to a solidifying structure if we see ch4 the h content is much much higher than c but whenever we tending from we are tending from ch4 to c23 c25 the paraphilic nature of the compound is decreasing the carbon content of the compound is increasing that is from being a lightweight compound it is tending to a heavyweight compound in all these reactions isomerization aromatization not in isomerization uh, aromatization uh, dehydrogenation dehydrocyclization wherever there is a dehydrogenation taking place that is hydrogen is being removed the carbon content that is the carbon percentage in the reformed compound is getting more and more and solidifying structure is trying to form so what happens is in a catalytic reforming unit whenever we are undergoing dehydrogenation there will be some scale formation of the heavyweight carbon of the heavyweight carbon compounds that are formed if a scale formation or a solid structure is trying to settle on the reactor itself it will create a lot of trouble scalings in the reactor which will not allow proper heat dissipation or heat transfer in the reactor itself in the fired heater that we are going to discuss in the later stages how is the CRU exactly how is the reforming unit in the fire heater deposits will be formed of this solid carbon compounds and there will be a lot of chaos in the system to prevent the solid formation we are deliberately feeding in hydrogen or we are utilizing the formed hydrogen in these reactions the removed hydrogen we are utilizing that in the presence of a catalyst to again reform the solid structures into gaseous or liquid structures so that no scaling forms. So that is why hydrocracking is an important reaction. First of all, to undergo isomerization. Secondly, to undergo removal of the scale formation on the reactor uh, bed or on the reactor catalyst. We do not desire that. And very importantly, this all these reactions are uh, selective reactions that is only the desired compounds will be formed and that temperature pressure and catalyst will be maintained so the catalyst for this catalytic reforming unit is particularly platinum and rhenium 
these are the two catalysts that are basically used in the catalytic reforming unit, a very important uh, aspect of the same. Hydroplacking is also being favored in the presence of platinum catalyst as we all know. Now talking about the catalyst, a very important concept associated with the catalytic reforming unit is sulfur and nitrogen. These two compounds, sulfur and nitrogen, poisons platinum and radium catalyst. Moreover, what it will do is, whenever sulfur is present, it sees hydrogen, it will form H2S and will straight away try to poison the platinum catalyst. It will try to depose it on the surface of platinum catalyst. Same goes with nitrogen. Whenever it sees hydrogen, because all of these are dehydrogenation reactions, so hydrogen will be liberated in the chamber. A lot of hydrogen will be formed. It will undergo NH3, it will form and it will try to fly off. And the hydrogen will not be used in the hydropacking process and it will further also degrade the platinum catalyst. It will try to poison the platinum catalyst. So these are effective poisons, catalytic poisons. So these has to be removed and this has to be removed in the hydro desulfurization unit. So a CRU should always be preceded by a hydro desulfurization unit, HDS unit. So a CRU in the industry is always, uh, the precursor is obviously a hydro desulfurization unit. Now all of this is to create, I'm going to remove this all of this reforming and all is to create a structure with low hydrogen firstly because hydrogen is a supporter of combustion so we don't need combustion and preventing easy attack by oxygen both these, both of these to prevent auto ignition of petrol or gasoline. So that before it comes down, it doesn't auto ignite by itself. To prevent the easy combustion or prevent auto ignition means easy combustion even in the absence of spark, even in the absence of spark, we have to prevent the easy combustion. That is, whenever that is getting heated, it's getting enough temperature. We have to increase the auto ignition temperature. It shouldn't reach the auto ignition temperature. That is, the auto ignition should be delayed. Auto ignition delayed after CRU. If we blend that in gasoline, the compounds should have a high auto ignition temperature. So, if we put light naphtha, that is C1 to C6 in the CRU, will it work? First of all, the minimum number of carbon atoms to undergo aromatization or dehydrocyclization, that is forming a cyclic structure, benzene, benzene is the parent of the aromatized uh, family, it has to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, where n is from Z1, 2, 3. So the minimum number of pi electrons that we need is 6 pi electrons. And that is only possible when it is C6. So C1 to C5 cannot undergo aromatization. And this is the most prolific reaction. Aromatization is the most prolific reaction in a CRU. So if C1 to C5 doesn't undergo aromatization, it will only enjoy a free ride in the CRU. There is no, uh, no benefit in providing C1 to C5 in the CRU. Why do we need to provide C1 to C5? Instead, at that temperature, C1 to C5 can undergo cracking in the presence of hydrogen. Hydro cracking may take this. Hydro cracking may take place, C1 to C5, and instead of forming compounds with high octane number, it will break down to C5 will break down to C1, C2, that is, it will form gaseous compounds, which is not utilizable in the gasoline industry. So, and talking about C6, C6 can undergo aromatization into benzene, but benzene has been proven carcinogenic in nature. Benzene is carcinogenic. So its formation or use in the petrol or the petroleum industry is bad. 
So we cannot use benzene, we cannot feed in uh, C1 to C5. So basically, light naphtha is a no no in CIO. No feeding of light naphtha will be there. So C5, C6, which are the basic components of gasoline, will actually not be sent in CIO. It will not be sent in CIO. What will be sent in CIO is C7, C8, some amount of C9 as well. That is heavy naphtha. Heavy naphtha is basically sent for reforming in a CRE, that is capturing reforming unit. C5, C6 will not be sent because C5 will not undergo hermitization. It will only enjoy a free ride. It can further undergo hydropacking to C1, to C1 and C2. And C6 will form uh, benzene. It will undergo aromatization, but it is unnecessary because uh, it is proven carcinogenic. So we cannot use it in petrol. So we will rather feed the next successors just beyond it, C7, C8, C9. This we will reform. Reform high octane, achieve high octane, prevent operating ignition and blend it, blend it with C5 and C6 form gasoline of high octane, form gasoline of high octane number. By blending C7, C8, C9 from the CRU to the C5, C6. That is my basic ingredient of gasoline. In, obviously, uh, we calculate those quantities, how much to mix and where to mix. So now coming straight away to the CRU unit. That is the CRU, that is the catalytic forming unit. How does it exactly look? It is something like this. This is my first reactor, R1. This is my fire heater, F1, having coils entering R2, fire heater 2, F2, entering R3, and this is F1, from F1 it is entering R1, F1 is receiving a feed of dehexanized. No hexanes because we do not want dehexanized naphtha. So no benzene formation should be allowed. Plus obviously hydrogen to undergo the hydro cracking reaction. So dehexanized naphtha is sprayed in plus hydrogen is sprayed in and it's going from fire heater 1 because remember these all these reactions this is a catalyst bed that is there catalyst bed all these reactions are endothermic reactions these are necessarily endothermic so we need heat to be supplied to the feed so feed is getting heated up then it is entering the first reactor wherein it is reacting it is undergoing reformation it is undergoing isomerization, it is undergoing aromatization, it is undergoing all those reactions that we have discussed previously. And then it is forming an aromatized, uh, less susceptible to oxygen attack compound, which is not undergoing it easy auto-ignition or easy combustion. Now, again, it will pass through F2, F2 to go to R2, that is, it will be further heated. Now what happens is most of the particles, most of the compounds gets reformed in this section. So actually very less amount of preheating is required in the second fire heater 2. So the heat required in F1 is greater than F2 is greater than F3. That is the heat. That is the heat requirement. F1 is greater than F2 is greater than F3. But the size of the reactors, the size of the reactors R1 is less than R2 is less than R3. Why this is so? Because the compounds that do not react in R1 are the compounds that need a greater residence time in the second reactor because they will require a greater residence time to be reformed. Uh, such structures are their structures. So to allow a greater residence time, we know 
tau, that is residence time is V by Q. If the flow rate is constant, then my V has to be more, that is the volume of the reactor. Volume of reactor has to be more for a greater residence time in the reactor so that the remaining particles can further react in reactor 2 and further react in reactor 3. So actually the size from R1 increases to R2 further increases to R3 and the heat requirement decreases from F1 to F2 to F3 because the feed is lesser and lesser. In the entire process, hydrogen is formed. H2, H2 because all the processes are dehydrogenation processes mostly except the hydropacking reaction which is there to remove the scale formation if any on the catalyst bed or on the reactor. All this hydrogen is recycled back. There is a circulating structure, the net hydrogen is recycled back, some amount of it is fed back into the chamber with a dehexanized naphtha and the rest of the H2 is used elsewhere in the industry particularly in the hydro desulfurization unit and the other units in the industry wherever you need H2 because we need H2 in a lot of uh, aspects in, in the refineries. So the most of the H2 whichever is required in the refinery section is being produced from the CRU. So CRU is a high source of H2. H2 CRU produces the H2 that you require and from this comes the final product. Actually this hydrogen I'm showing it's separated from the chambers itself along with that along with that the product also has some amount of liquid and definitely some amount of hydrogen which is again getting mixed with the stream and circulating through the chamber to other parts of the refinery. Now how is this done is this product is flashed that is its pressure is decreasing. Now when the pressure is dipped we already know that boiling point will dip. When the boiling point will dip H2 will form vapor, the liquid will not form vapor, the pressure is being maintained as such. This liquid will go out in a distillation unit wherein the reformate will be collected from the bottom and the top product will be C1, C2, C3, C4, the gaseous form products. And this is particularly known as the stabilizer in a CRE. This stabilizer produces the reformed liquid from the bottom that is reformed C7, C8, C9. And this reformed structure is blended with gasoline blended with C5 and C6 externally in a blending unit and further sent to the gasoline industry. Now this C5, C7, C8, this reformate has high octane number, so high auto ignition ratio or auto ignition temperature. So this is the entire structure. Three reactors, maybe one swing reactor because this catalyst bed this catalyst bed in each of the reactor needs regeneration and after a certain point of time you need to take it out, you need to regenerate it and refeed it into the bed. So there is always a spare reactor or swing reactor, it's called a swing reactor. It's brought in line whenever you need to regenerate the catalyst in one of the reactors. That is, in the re That reactor is brought offline and swing reactor is brought online. So this is the entire structure of a reforming unit. The purpose being to increase the octane number, to decrease the auto ignition temperature, to decrease the auto ignition temperature so that it does not get auto ignited, and to decrease sorry to increase the auto ignition temperature that is at a higher temperature it will get auto ignited the auto ignition tendency will be decreased so this is the purpose of the CRU no self combustion should take place in spark ignition petrol 
in you. That is the requirement. And why is it not required? You can refer to the knocking video, you can refer to the petrol engine versus diesel engine video. That will give you a clearer idea of what happens in knocking, what happens if auto-ignition is taking place, how does this auto-ignition take place to have a clearer idea. I think that's it for today. I think I have made clear what is CRU, what is it all about, why and how it is used, the entire structure of the CRU system, uh, how it is formed, what is stabilizer, all of these questions have been answered, why is octane number requirement high, what if octane number is low, we have discussed all of that. And that's it for today. If you liked our video, like it, share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.